there's going to be a seminar in Hamburg this coming weekend. I was originally scheduled to be one of the participants, but because of the coronavirus restrictions, I won't be there. The talk is going to be given by Helmut Dunkhauser, who is the person translating the German edition of How the World Works. And in the lead up to him giving the talk, he sent me some questions about how you calculate the rate of profit. And it occurred to me that rather than just explain it to him, it's worth putting out a short video on it because there are some issues here which you're going to encounter if you start doing empirical work trying to work out the rate of profit in your country. In Volume 1 of Capital, Karl Marx was concerned with explaining the value of commodities. And he says that the value of the commodity is made up of two main parts. The labour content of the constant capital consumed and the new value added by labour, by living labour. And he uses the small letter C to stand for the constant capital. The value added by living labour is broken down into two parts. Wages, which he calls variable capital, and he denotes by the small letter V. And the remainder, which was called Mehrwert, or in the English edition, surplus value. In the original, this was denoted by the letter M in small letters, and in English editions, it's denoted by the letter S. The units used are such that Marx switches in his explanation because he treats them as, for many purposes, equivalent. He expresses his variables either in hours or in pounds, and he assumes a rate of equivalence between hours and pounds. Suppose that one week's work at a cotton mill is worth a thousand pounds. Obviously a pound was worth a lot more in the days when he was writing. This might be broken down as constant capital or small c 400 pounds a week, variable capital small v 300 pounds a week and surplus value 300 pounds a week to give the total value of 1000. So these are the component parts of the value of the final product. One week, well, we take the final product to be one week's worth of cotton, cotton yarn. He then looks at ratios. Uh, the first one he introduces the rate of surplus value, which he writes as S over V. Now note, this is a pure dimensionless number. Since the units above and below units on the top and below have the same units. The, the variables above and below have the same units. They're both in pounds per week. So if you divide pounds per week by pounds per week, you get a dimensionless number, which you can express as a percentage. In volume one of Capital, he gives only a very brief account of the rate of profit and mentions it as an aside in discussing the way other economists have dealt with the issue very briefly and accuses them of confusing the rate of profit with the rate of surplus value. The, the first point in which he raises it and where he actually gives a mathematical formula for it is in chapter 17 where he says, assume a capital C of £500 is initially made out of raw material, instruments of labour, etc., up to the amount of £400, and wages V up to the amount of £100, and further, that the surplus value is £100. Then we have rate of surplus value equals 100 over 100, which is 100%, but the rate of profit is £100 over £500, which is 20%. So he's basically accusing the earlier economists of confusing the rate of surplus value and the rate of profit because they don't take into account the constant capital. 
Uh, it's worth noting that the English edition of this, I haven't been able to find the corresponding passage in my German text. The English edition of it uses, has got a misprint, small c here. By context, he sh this should be large c. I suspect this is a proofreader's or translator's error. Um, if it's, we can see by context, by large c, he actually means small c plus small v. And this is the formula which Marxist economists subsequently generally use for the rate of profit. And it derives from this one small passage in, in volume one. When you come to volume three, it's no longer possible to have such a simple analysis. The important point is you now have to take into account fixed capital. The, the small c in volume one is made up of raw materials and what we would now call depreciation in accounting terms, wear and tear on the machinery. But for capital equipment that lasts many years, this definition of C plus V underestimates the quantity of capital by a very large margin. For example, one of the largest types of capital equipment that has to be invested in now is chip manufacturing parts. The TMC Corporation in Taiwan apparently invested about 3 billion in a wafer fat plant in 2012 uh, that's still operating. Now let's assume they have a 14 year life and we depreciate that. Then let's suppose that in 2016 they invest 4 billion in a second plant because the cost of these plants is going up. If we were to use C as just being the depreciation, the first year's depreciation in 2013, we would get a sum of $214 million as the constant capital. And if we use this to compute the rate of profit, we'd grossly underestimate the real rate of profit because the real rate of profit in 2013 had to be, should have been calculated on the then existing value or the then starting value at the start of the year of their constant capital stock, 3 billion, not 214 million. When calculating the value of the output, we still use depreciation. But when calculating the profit rate, it's important that you use the total stock as the divisor. And that this stock at any one time will be made up of a mixture of different plant and equipment at different ages. So up until 2015, we can say it was just plant one that made up the capital stock. They open a new plant in 2016, and now the greater part of the capital stock is made up of the value of plant two. And this in turn depreciates and they both depreciate. So the, the value of the stock fluctuates from year to year depending on how much investment they've made and how much that has run down. And it's important that you don't confuse this with the stock market rate of return. The stock market rate of return is given by dividends over the market price of shares. And these are removed by quite a distance from the real economic relations. Most importantly, because the market price of a share can fluctuate wildly in response to leaks about expected dividends. So this ratio tends to be driven by the rate of interest plus a risk premium. Suppose a speculator hears that a share is likely to give a, a dividend of $3 this year. And if the rate of interest is very low as it is now at 1%, it will be well worth his while borrowing $200 to buy a share since he can pay the interest off and still make a profit of one pound. So thus, if the state bank lowers the rate of interest, the price of shares tends to rise. He wouldn't offer a full $300 for the price, which would be the equivalent to the rate of interest, because he can't be sure that the leak about expected dividends is correct. This means that there's an inverse relationship 
between fictional capital and the rate of interest. The value of shares is fictional capital. It's not directly equal to the real capital employed by firms. And if the bank rate falls, the stock market price of fictional capital tends to rise, even if the value of real capital hasn't changed. The value of real capital can only change either through wear and tear or through transformations in the mode of material production which renders a particular type of material uh, of, of capital stock obsolete. So, for example, in the case of the TMC plant, as you move from a factory capable of producing a 22 nanometer process to one capable of producing a 14 nanometer or a 7 nanometer process, each time one of those revolutions occurs, the previous capital stock becomes depreciated because it's no longer the most efficient way to produce transistors. So the price of fictitious capital, the capital traded on the stock market, is determined by the interest rate and the expected mass of profit. Now, I've been saying this for years, never bothered to check it. Uh, yesterday I did the check. Here we have on the top line the FTSE 100 index um, going from the late 1980s to 2017 or so. And I've done it on a log scale because I'm trying to show two different quantities which are widely different in magnitude, the FTSE index and the rate of interest. Rate of interest varies from about 15% down to 1%. The FTSE index starts at 1700 and rises up to about 7000. So to put them both on the same graph, you have to use the log scale. Now, it's fairly clear that the tendency of the rate of interest has been down and the tendency of the rate of profit has been up. And if you actually form a correlation between them, you find there is a negative correlation of about minus 75% between the two. So that is to say, 75% of the stock price rises is accounted for by the bank rate falls. So, note, the bank rate is being set by the state. It's being set by the state bank, by the rate at which it will lend money to the private banking sector. And this then drives the valuation of fictitious capital. But it would be a big mistake to take the valuation of fictitious capital as itself being the valuation of the real capital stock. But this is not to deny that there is a real decline in the rate of profit which forces the state bank to repeatedly lower the rate of interest to, pro to sustain economic activity in the face of a falling real rate of profit. But if you want to measure the real rate of profit, you have to go and look at estimates of the real capital stock in a country. And then compare that to the actual surplus value. Okay, that'll do.